So cultural differences are important uh, in, in the work environment. So we need to navigate those and that will determine your ability to be successful. So if you spend time on those aspects, uh, I think you're going to be very successful. Hi, Alberto. Thanks for being here today. So first, can you please share with us a little bit about yourself and your career journey thus far? Yeah, absolutely, Bea. And first of all, a pleasure to see you again. Uh, and let me congratulate you for this initiative you have. I think it's great that you are interviewing people around the globe and a lot of colleagues, actuaries, non-actuaries and other professionals are watching these interviews in your YouTube channels. It's good that you disseminate on LinkedIn. So it's, it's pretty awesome initiative. So congratulations on that. In my particular case, uh, my name is Alberto, as you mentioned. I'm from Mexico originally, and I moved to the U.S. around 15 years ago. So I was part of kind of the beneficiaries of the North American Trade Agreement, where it recognizes uh, professions such as mathematicians and actuaries uh, and enable them to work temporarily in the U.S. and Canada. So I'm, I'm an expat and I think an expatriate, and I think that's a good title for many of us to have these days because as you can see, right, uh, many people is moving geographies, particularly in the actuarial field. So I've been working for about 20 years in the industry. Uh, I also had previous experience working in Mexico as practicing practitioner in, in the actual sciences. So primarily I've been focused on consulting. Uh, the company that I'm working right now, it's a Standard & Poor's uh, company, and we do a lot of consulting work. And I overlook uh, different areas of actual practice, uh, you know, insurance, uh, pensions, health, and risk management. But the biggest focus these days have been towards uh, risk management. I think the industry is transforming a lot, and we are seeing a lot of focus there. So very excited uh, to be here and to share some of my limited experience. Obviously, all the views that I will be sharing today are my own personal views. I'm not representing my company not representing my actual organization, just, just my own personal views, hoping that these views can help others to, to use them as guiding principles or learn something about uh, Mexican actuaries working in, in, in US. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, knowing more about the uh, Mexico actual professions and everything. So uh, what are the roles of actuaries at the CRI, SIL, and S&P Global Company? Can you elaborate on it a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the name of the company is Crisil. It's an Indian-based uh, company, and, and it started around 30 years ago as a rating agency. And then it got acquired by Standard & Poor's. So it was pretty much doing ratings for Indian companies, just as Standard & Poor's will do all over the world. And then Crystal started to transform itself into a more uh, quantitative uh, company oriented. Uh, we acquired a few organizations that had that capability branch and, and that brought a lot of quant power. So right now we are 3000 employees uh, widespread across the globe. Uh, our footprint is probably more focused in India, obviously. Uh, we have large offices in Poland and Argentina because we benefit a lot of the uh, geographical uh, work, uh, labor arbitrage, and the talent. And, and we also have rep representation offices in different countries like, uh, you know, uh, France, UK, uh, and the headquarters are in the US, right, in New York, in, in Water Street. Uh, so within that uh, big scale of things, uh, the international divisions, which is the one that I belong to, uh, is dedicated for global research and analytics uh, uh, aspects. We have an actuarial group. Uh, I'm part of 600 quants that we have in the company. Uh, most of them are PhDs or masters in sciences. And we do a lot of quantitative work for banks and insurance companies, financial um, uh, services, uh, trust funds, mutual funds, and all those kind of financial services aspects, right? And, and the actuarial roles that we have available in our company are related to that uh, around model risk management, uh, we do a lot of model development for insurance companies, and we also help them validate models as well. Uh, and, and that goes for any kind of insurance, right? Uh, life insurance, general insurance, health insurance. Uh, we also do work for banks. We have actuaries working for banks supporting banking functions. And, and, and we also have 
Oxford is doing other kind of work like research. And in my case, I oversight all those different kind of activities, mostly uh, actuarial and non-actuarial, because my skill is kind of uh, very mixed between actuarial services and non-traditional areas. So I'm also uh, dealing with a lot of functions that are not necessarily tied to the traditional actuarial work, uh, such as uh, um, data science. We are doing a lot of uh, prototyping, uh, experimentation, research around artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, building capabilities internally, and also uh, helping uh, clients to be, build capabilities themselves. And we leverage a lot of things, right? We leverage uh, startups, accelerators, uh, different companies that are coming into the market. We talk to them, we talk to the industry, and, and I'm involved in all, all those things, right? Uh, but to keep it simple, uh, we have different kind of actual talent. Uh, they, they all follow uh, the typical actual path because most of them are based in India. So they will go uh, under the UK type of path for, for being an actuary. They see it and present exams, a uh, similar path for people who is based of the US and Canada as well. So it really depends on which country they are uh, located. Uh, this talent, they will undergo in a specific path for uh, becoming an actuary. And depending what kind of ambitions they have in the profession and, and the areas of practice they want to look at crystal as well. Mm, that's great to hear. And uh, it's, I think these days that um, the actuaries also work in like the non-traditional areas and non-traditional roles. So I think excited to hear that, like uh, you say, the actuaries have uh, some work with the banks. I think that is a new area and risk management is always like has been recently, like in the past decade, is uh, uh, it, like a field that the actuaries tend to work more in. And myself, I also work in the risk management. So yeah, that's good too. That's good to hear. Yeah. So uh, can you, um, uh, so like many viewers, like coming from like different, many viewers, my channel coming from like different parts of the world, including the Mexico. Uh, so how can one become an actuary in Mexico? Okay, now that's that's a big question, um, B, and I think uh, one of the things that I would like to promote, and, and it's very important for all of us to be aware, is that we need to travel. Uh, we need to work um, in, in different locations, uh, especially outside our own countries, so that we can get exposure to uh, the different practices that are out there, to get exposure to different talent, and absorb as much knowledge as we can, especially we are uh, people who is coming out of the uh, colleges or universities and trying to get a career, uh, not only on actual sciences, but also in the quantitative and consulting services, because that's a skill that it's in high demand. It's very important. And these days, uh, given the openness of the market to hire worldwide, it's not easy, but it's uh, feasible to obtain. So in terms of your specific question, uh, in Mexico, um, we probably need to talk first about uh, the mutual recognition agreements that there are across the globe uh, with respect to the actuarial organization. So there is a mapping of these uh, recognitions between different countries. So if you are considering to uh, be an expatriate and work abroad, uh, you really need to focus first on which country you want to select. And, and you need to understand in which country you are. Uh, and understand the rules to become an actor in your own country and understand the rules of the hosting country that will require you to be an actor. And being mindful that uh, there are recognition, recognition agreements between actual organizations. So that's the first thing we need to have clear. The second thing that we need to have clear is that uh, there are also immigration aspects. Uh, in the case of North America, US, uh, um, Mexico and, and Canada, there are already agreements in place. If you look at the NAFTA agreement in 1994, uh, they included the term mathematician uh, to be a profession that you can aspire to get a temporary permit to work either, if you're Mexican, right, to work in Canada and US or vice versa, right? You will get a temporary permit to work uh, just because you are a mathematician. And in 2003, they added a footnote. These also include actuaries, right? So mm -hmm. starting 2003, we, we found a lot of actuaries from Mexico going to US and Canada and vice versa. And as a result of that, the new agreement that is in place in 2020, uh, it's following the same practice. And what happens is that there is no mutual recognition agreement between Mexico and North America. 
with respect to the actual sciences. So we don't recognize each other. So that's the first thing that we need to, to keep in mind. Uh, however, uh, because of this immigration agreement, if you are a Mexican, actually you can work in the US and Canada. If you are thinking the other way around, uh, we, we have in our regulation, some recognition for certain actual societies and certain memberships. So for example, if you are an ASA, an FSA or a CIA, which are the acronyms for colleagues who are uh, practitioners in Canada and US, you can also work in Mexico because there are some functions, especially in the risk management space, in the banking space, and in some retirement investment areas where that particular uh, credential is valuable. And, and so that's the first thing, but we also have regulation that incorporates CFAs as well, right? Certified financial mm -hmm. analyst or enterprise risk management. So it's not exclusive for actuaries. So if you're a professional who holds those credentials, it's going to be very easy for you to migrate to Mexico and work. Now, if you are a person who is just coming out of the market, it's also easy to get a job because there are a lot of skills that are required in Mexico these days. If you go to our financial hubs in Mexico, in Monterrey, Guadalajara, or Mexico City, you will see a lot of people from Korea, from China, from India, uh, from Europe, very young people, right? And very young means between 20 and, and, and 30 years old. And as you know, people from Asia have the tendency to hold master's degree at the age of 23, right, 25. So they, they have a good job in Mexico, paid in dollars, doing functions where we have a gap of talent. It may not necessarily be like an actuarial traditional path, but it will be definitely a good job uh, to, to be and have in Mexico, where, as you know, Mexico City is in the top five of uh, ranked in, in expat cities, right? So it's very welcoming for expats. So there are good reasons to go there. Uh, but in order to become an actor in Mexico, uh, to answer your question, finally, the only way to do it is to study in the university and obtain a degree in actuarial sciences. That's the only way you will be an actuary because the patent to be an actuary, it's provided by the government or the secretary of, of education or ministry of education. They provide a, 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 a credential to you, a physical uh, ID, where it states your profession and you will say actuary. Uh, so that's the only way you can get that. And if you want to be a certified actuary, you need to take and pass the exam from the regulator. For example, if you want to practice in PNC, then you will need to go to the insurance regulator and you will need to take and pass the exam to be able to sign the reserves and the liabilities for PNC. And obviously they also require uh, years of experience to take the exam. So it's not like you are a graduate and you will take the exam. It's not like that. You also need to have experience to take and pass the exam as well. Industry experience, relevant industry experience. And the way they did that is because uh, the government don't trust actual organizations, right? Past organizations have not done a good job in maintaining uh, and upgrading uh, and having good uh, ongoing continuous education. So to, to mind that gap, the regulator took that over and basically we just need to pass the exams from them. And, and that happens every two years, right? You need to renew your credential if you are signing liabilities or doing actuarial certifications for insurance companies or for uh, retirement plans as well. So that's kind of how it works in Mexico. Uh, but you know there are a lot of good uh, job opportunities or postings out there uh, because English is kind of very important to have in, in, in the actuarial field, uh, either for traditional and non-traditional areas as well. For the non-traditional areas, such as data science, we also have the credential, right? So the Ministry of Education come up with that two years ago. So unless you uh, undertake a, a course in the university as a credit scientist, you cannot call yourself a uh, data scientist. So you need to take a full course in the university. And if you pass the exams, you will be a data scientist. So that, that's something that is gonna happen probably three years from now because it started one or two years ago. And what that means that is that if you have a designation in LinkedIn in Mexico, hey, I'm a data scientist, unless you have that ID showing it, then you're lying, right? Because just because your designation says data scientist, that doesn't mean that you are a data scientist. So that's the kind of interesting things and differences that happen in Mexico just because of the uh, regulatory structure and the way the professional dynamics happen there. So hopefully <laughs> uh, that long answer be uh, it's clear enough for, for, for the audience of your uh, channel. 
It's actually pretty interesting to hear the differences because like uh, in, well, in Canada or like in the US, we just mm-hmm. like, we can study anything in university. It doesn't really matter if we study in university and if we pass the exams, uh, then we get the associate fellow <laughs> then we can call ourselves an actuary. Although in Canada, you do need to uh, be a member of the Canadian Institute of Actuary as well in order to mm-hmm. like uh, uh, call yourself an, an actuary here. So like, I just want to clarify. So let's say if you are an uh, FSA, when you go and work in uh, Mexico, do you need to take uh, another exam, the license exam that you say, like for like maybe PNC and stuff in order to call yourself an actuary or because you already have that mutual recognition, then you don't need to. Mm-hmm. It depends on the area. Uh, if you are applying for a job where the regulation it's not a specifically stating that FSA with a specific area, right? Exam X on a specialty on investments. If you don't have that, then you either will have to take the investments path from the FSA or take the exam from the regulator to be recognized in Mexico as an actuary who is able to sign documents under that particular sector. Uh, but th- that recognition is basically done at the regulatory level. It's not done at, at the actual organization level or it's not done at the job level. So that's the part that we need to be mindful about, right? It's done at the regulatory level. And in terms of the immigration aspect, it will be treated uh, in the framework of the North America Trade Agreement. So that part is covered because we have, as as country or foreign ministry aspects, we have that recognition implicit, right? Uh, And it's kind of in in one of the uh, temporary entry uh, uh, sections in the new trade agreement that came into effect 1st of July 2020. It's quite interesting because like uh, from my perspective like experience so far like the which FSA track that we choose didn't mm-hmm. really matter in the North American market like in my company like nobody gonna ask what track did you choose to write for the FSA but it seemed like it make a difference if you, uh, for the Mes- Mexico market so that that's why uh interesting and good to know and then uh, the main thing is like I guess for people who are interested in working internationally it's like always doing the research first to see what you have to do or what requirements there are and I'm sure uh, if we went through all of those actual exams or those education we we sure can do another exam <laughs> to, to <practice. laughs> yeah absolutely and, I, and I'll tell you the story on how that happened right uh, so basically we have a lot of insurance companies, right, which are multinational, a lot of uh, international banks as well. So what the government did was look at all the heads, right? Oh, who is the CRO? Who is the chief of investments? Who is this guy? And they look at their credentials. And it happened that those that were doing a get, very good job with the regulator, they hold these credentials. So the regulator said, oh, I think it's a good idea to include this as a requirement for people working on this field to hold this credential in order to practice it, um, if you want to skip the exam, right? So that's how those uh, tracks were selected in designing the regulation. So the uh, policymakers were looking at those details when generating the, the regulations that are aimed to uh, take an oversight of the things that are happening at the actual field in Mexico or other areas that are adjacent to the actual function. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. So previously, you did mention that like there are still a lot of opportunities uh, in Mexico. Uh, um, so can you elaborate a little bit more about like uh, what business opportunities are there for international actuaries in Mexico? Yeah, no, I think there are opportunities in all areas of practice. And the reason there are opportunities is because we are lacking innovation. Uh, so the idiosyncrasy in Mexico is not to aim to have innovation but a lot of big companies are very focused on innovation, right? And, and the speed that they are responding internally, it's very slow. So are looking, they are looking at two things, right? One, international talent, and two, partnering with companies who have that capability. And in the particular case of hiring talent, uh, they are looking at talent that is coming overseas. So for example, if you are a Spanish bank, right? Uh, operating in Mexico, you know, Santander, uh, Bilbao Vizcaya, all those different type of banks, they will bring people from Spain, right? Uh, from Barcelona, especially because they have a lot of uh, technology background. Uh, whereas if you are 
a, a, a Morgan Stanley or other the type of company, they may bring people from, from, from India, right? There are also Chinese banks, uh, Vietnamese banks as well. Uh, so they will bring talent from their own country because they are lacking those type of skills. Uh, and that's talent that arrives in Mexico with an expatriate tag where they can aspire to have, you know, uh, um, top knock type of salary tiers uh, because they are expats uh, and they have good uh, compensation packages as well. I'm not too aware of compensation packages itself, but obviously the, the tendency to attract talent overseas comes with that as well, right? So those opportunities are uh, in the banking sector, the first priority because that's the one that it's more innovative, uh, has more budget to attract talent. So I would say that's the sector number one. Uh, sector number two is um, uh, investment funds. And sector number three is insurance companies, but those insurance companies that are multinational that have a good focus and a strategy to operate in Mexico. And they also have operations in Latin America because a lot of uh, international companies are using Mexico as an operation hub for Latin America and also use uh, Mexico as um, centers of excellence for uh, conducting operations from countries like uh, Canada and US because of the time zone and talent availability as well. So that's some of the uh, dynamics that in my limited experience I have been able to observe. Mm, that's great. So now let's talk about um, international students uh, from Mexico wanting to work in the North American market. So what would be your advice for international students student to get into the actual market in North America? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, in the past, and I'm talking to you about 20 years ago, I think it was different and more difficult because uh, uh, especially in my own experience, right, when I arrived into the U.S., uh, the, the actuaries were uh, more traditional <laughs> than what they are today. So the profession has transformed itself a lot and, and the country has transformed itself a lot. So now, uh, countries like Canada and US are more welcoming for international talent, uh, just because the uh, leadership demographics in the companies receiving talent has changed as well. So having said that, uh, it's a good time to seek for opportunities uh, in, in North America. But one of the first steps you need to make as a, a student coming out from the market is you need to start uh, creating links with professionals, right? And by links, I'm referring, go into the website, find some names, try to talk to them, interview them. I have found like uh, this setup that we are making today, like interview environment, you learn a lot, right? I learn a lot from UB. Uh, I'm probably sharing some views that you didn't know before. So you need to do that as a student. You need to talk to professionals before making a decision because that will generate ideas on your approach that may potentially generate opportunities. And you will also understand some of the aspects that are happening in the market. So if you do that for two or three months after that cycle, then you will be more comfortable talking with HR people from the companies that you are targeting on the business function that you are interested to know about. And that will enable you to have great presentations during your interview sessions with the HR people or recruiters. So that process is very important. And these days it's very easy to have, right? You just go to LinkedIn or whatever social network you prefer, uh, lays with those professionals, start conducting sessions virtually, and that will give you a good uh, um, path to, to understand what's going on in the market. Uh, the other aspects is uh, try to talk to students too, right? Because students locally, for example, if you look in Canada in areas like Waterloo, they are kind of uh, very close related to companies, uh, they have uh, programs in the university where they are basically hired immediately after the school, right? They go to Toronto, they, would, they go to other areas, try to talk to them and see what kind of challenges they are facing. Because even they are local, locally hired, they are facing challenges to get a good job, right? The job market is not what it used to be before. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, actually is where hired immediately, they were making a lot of money, but that's not happening anymore. And the reason for that is because the, the actuarial uh, models and the actuarial consumption of information has changed. The, the focus now, it's, it's different. And we need to adapt ourselves to, to accommodate that. So your preparation as a student needs to be different. I'm not saying not, don't take the actual path. What I'm saying is you need to be aware of those things. You need to transform yourself, adapt to that, 
and bring that into your speech when presenting to other colleagues for the work or job that you are trying to aspire in North America. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's, it's definitely it's definitely doable, right? I'm, I'm here, right? <laughs> so yeah. it, it should be somehow easy to do, right? <laughs> yeah, great advice. I mean, to get a good job, like a good job doesn't come easily. And I'm sure it is the same for any other profession. So uh, if something worthwhile, many people want to pursue it. So that's why you need to invest and put effort into it and go for it. Yeah. So last but not least, do you have any other final advice for aspiring actuaries in general for those who want to become an actuary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think we have a lot of uh, suggestions. Uh, the first suggestion is that we have the tendency to be very uh, technical focused, right? And our preparation, either uh, university um, feed or actuarial society feed, uh, you, you need to be mindful of the things that are happening outside your own world, right? Uh, the actuarial field is very uh, specialized, and that has the advantage that uh, you know a lot of things about one specific field. However, in a real business environment, professionals need to be aware of many other different things as well, right? So your knowledge, your domain expertise need to be wider. And what that means is that it's not okay that you just pass the first exam of your actual organization, right? You need to know more. You need to know about regulations. You need to know about accounting. You need to know about um, data scientists. What are they doing? You need to know about what are the business big picture aspects of your company you are applying for? Uh, you need to have a good social skill to understand and convey the messages that technically make sense on paper, technically make sense on your uh, output, but you need to learn how to have those communication skills to convey them properly. So the suggestion is uh, focus a lot on that, uh, on your world outside the math that you know very well. That's the foundation. You need to know a lot about what's happening in the market. You need to know about how to communicate your results. If, if possible, take soft skills courses. Uh, I think that will bring a lot of value to, to yourself uh, and you will be more successful working with others. And the third component is you need to know how to work on their diverse teams. So for example, in my case, right? My English is not perfect. Sometimes that has closed me doors. Sometimes that has open doors. Uh, but all my team comes from different backgrounds, right? I have people from, from Paris, people from Mumbai, people from Hangzhou, people from New York, and we need to work together. So cultural differences are important uh, in, in the work environment. So we need to navigate those and that will determine your ability to be successful. So if you spend time on those aspects, uh, I think you're going to be very successful. Uh, the other warning is that being an actuary is not necessarily as fancy as it used to be before, right? So we have good technical skills, but we need to bring other aspects in our equipment or tools, right? You, you need to know about data science. And there are a lot of things that you can do, right? You can go to Kegel and participate in those uh, uh, contest to understand and apply the methodologies that were taught to you in the school and you didn't put attention. <laughs> so you need to, to do more things uh, above and beyond of what is expected in the actuarial syllabus or curriculums if you're looking at actual organizations or if you are looking at the syllabus or your own universities. I know it sounds overwhelming, but if you invest on those aspects today, I'm pretty sure they paid off in the future because uh, in my case, right, I started studying English when I was uh, 20, 22, and then I came to the U.S. when I was 25, right? So I think <laughs> there is, a, there is a, a reason why you should do it before, otherwise you will be struggling later, or other people will take the positions that otherwise you will, will have gotten instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree that, like, uh, now to become an actuary, one need to uh, position themselves to uh, be a well-rounded one, like develop more soft skill and like technical skill. And uh, I would say that uh, as we have to, the, the bachelor profession have to be like, continue to evolve and embrace the changes. And I think that's the same for any other professions. So I think uh, with us, like going through all of those exams, it gives us like the discipline and the ability to learn. 
So I think we own, like if, if we already like an actuaries, we have that self-driven. So we just have to keep continue going to like be mm -hmm. up to date with all of the changes in the profession. Yeah. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, thanks again for being here today and sharing like on your experiences and knowledge and stuff. Like I'm sure our view of Wi-Fi is very valuable. Yeah, on the contrary, it be a pleasure to be here. Uh, congratulations on this initiative. And I hope a lot of people connect with you, ask you questions, and hopefully we can help some uh, student actuaries or uh, aspiring actuaries to be more successful in their journeys. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.